To moderate our next session, Species and Spaces, Big Thinking on Land and Sea, we have invited the senior editor from Politico, Ryan Heath. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for joining us for this session. I'm Ryan Heath, and we're bringing you big thinkers who have got large scale ideas for change in both land and sea environments. Our three panelists for the first part of this two part session are Stephen Montford, director of the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. Enrique Sala, who has the coolest title you're going to hear all day. He's National Geographic Explorer in Residence and the founder of Pristine Seas. I'm guessing he didn't expect to literally be an explorer stuck in his residence during this pandemic. And last but not least, Carrie Seltzer. She's stakeholder engagement strategist for iNaturalist, the amazing citizen science platform. Thank you all for joining us today. Now, Stephen, let Thanks me start for the with invitation. you. Since you uh, helped, <laughs> you're very welcome. Now, Stephen, let me start with you since you helped create the Earth Optimism Summit back in 2017. Now, you've spent your career trying to save species, mostly on land. And as we all take time these days to reassess what really matters, tell us what are you urging your institution, your colleagues in other zoos and institutions, and the government to focus on? Yeah, well, fundamentally, we're trying to keep our, our eye on the ball, which is um, we have problems that relate to climate change, of course, that we're very concerned about. But also uh, the issue of biodiversity loss is something that is very important um, for all of us, all of humanity. So the thing that we focus on primarily from the point of view of a zoo, uh, a zoo community, our species, but we, we, we know that we have to pay attention to biodiversity to the species that, that constitute all of life on Earth, but also uh, functioning ecosystems. And we're trying to get people to pay attention to the fact that what we do with respect to biodiversity is both a human issue, a welfare issue for us. Uh, it's in our own benefit, actually, to sustain biodiversity and functioning systems, and at the same time, fighting uh, the fight to, to reduce the impacts of global climate change. So. Part of what I've been doing is trying to keep people focused on a two-pronged front. We have to look at climate change, but we have to not lose sight of the fact that species are in decline and, and they're under great threat. So um, we work at, at all ends of the spectrum, but from our point of view, it's we work with species and then we work on the systems that they require to survive. But frankly, they're the same systems that we all require to survive and thrive. And a follow up question to you there, Stephen. We know that biodiversity and climate change are linked, as you just said, but it's often climate change that gets the headlines, it gets the wallets open and, and the heartstrings pulled. What are you doing and what can you do further to make sure that biodiversity doesn't get lost in that mix? We know there's going to be a race for all of this government stimulus money from climate change advocates, for example, uh, in coming months. What are you doing to throw yourself directly in there? Well, we, we need to remind people that long before climate change was something we even thought about very, very much, uh, we had we were very effective at, at um, it, it reducing biodiversity uh, as humans. So things like uh, habitat loss and fragmentation, invasive species, uh, you know, uh, pandemic disease is, is one of the ultimate representations of an invasive organism. Um, and so what we're trying to get people to focus on is that um, when we take care of Mother Nature, Mother Nature is going to take care of us. And so we try and uh, emphasize the uh, not only the um, you know, the biodiversity elements, but we try to come down to the human elements. And we talk about why biodiversity matters. It has to do with, uh, if you look around the world, you know, economic prosperity is linked to biodiversity, the, the food, the, the fuel, the fiber, the air, the water, all of those things come from biodiversity. Uh, security, you know, is something people compete over biodiversity when it's scarce, resources, and it's something like 90% of all the people who are in poverty rely on natural resources for their own survival. And then of course the health. Health is related to uh, being good to mother nature. And, and when we disrupt uh, ecosystems and we interfere with biodiversity, we put 
uh, livestock and humans in contact with wildlife that were never together before. And what we end up with are spillover of viruses and massive economic consequences, health consequences, prosperity consequences. So we're trying to, we try to, you know, go everything from the heartstrings, people's love of animals, uh, everything from, from that all the way out to why it makes uh, good uh, economic sense, good policy sense for us to pay attention to biodiversity at the same time. We have to learn to do both things. We wouldn't want to have uh, climate change solved and then have uh, no biodiversity uh, left to try and save. Absolutely. I wanted to bring uh, Enrique in now. Enrique, you're an oceans expert. How much does that message from Stephen resonate uh, with you? Are you optimistic that you can uh, pick up the biodiversity work uh, in the oceans as well? Oh, absolutely. You know, the, the main source of this pandemic was our broken relationship with nature. In this case, it's a virus that went from a bat to a pangolin to a human, and then it spread like wildfire among humans. But our destruction of the natural world, deforestation, overfishing, the microbialization of the ocean, turning an ocean that was clear and free of, of bacteria and pathogens to an ocean that is more and more dominated by bacteria and pathogens, this has also consequences for human health, right? So it is uh, not just this pandemic. Uh, this is actually the, the loudest wake up call we ever had. Now, this is not like climate change where some people thought it was something that was going to happen in the future. Or, you know, Ebola, that it was going to happen somewhere else, maybe in Africa and not affecting us. But now everybody on the planet, everybody is suffering from our broken relationship with nature. So now is the time to remind everybody that a healthy ocean and a healthy terrestrial ecosystems are the best vaccine we can have for future crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, you've done amazing work at Pristine Seas to ensure an extra 5 million square miles of our oceans can be preserved. But can you put that in context, context for everybody who's watching? How much more of our wild spaces in the oceans do we need to protect? And how at risk are they from mining, indiscriminate dredging, pollution, from warming, all of those factors? Yes, when we started Pristine Seas about a decade ago, only 0.1% of the ocean was fully protected from fishing, oil drilling, mining, and other activities. And about 1% of the ocean was in uh, marine protected areas that provided some kind of protection. Since then, we have worked with governments and communities to help create 22 of the largest marine reserves in the world, covering a total area that is about almost 2% of the ocean. But today, overall, only 7% of the ocean is in areas that have been designated or proposed as protected. But we need much more. The science is very clear. If we want to prevent the extinction of 1 million species and the collapse of our life support system, if we want to achieve the Paris climate goals, we need half of the planet managed responsibly and the other half in natural state. And we can start by committing together, by protecting 30% of the planet, at least 30% of the planet by 2030. This is what the science is telling us. That's the science, uh, um, the agreement from the scientific community is overwhelming about that. As I was watching one of your recent videos in the Galapagos Islands, I was stunned to realize that it's only very recently that some of those areas uh, became off limits to fishing. So I'm wondering how we get to that end goal you've just described. Can we do it through these piecemeal measures or do we have to start thinking about regional or global deals, a blue deal maybe, that complements these green deals that have been pushed and adopted in various parts of the world. Yes, we have an opportunity now. The convention, the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity was supposed to have its COP15, its Conference of the Parties, this October in China. But the coronavirus has postponed the conference for next year. And that's the time and the place when the world is going to get together 
to agree how much more space we are willing to give to nature, both land and sea. There is already a draft of this agreement, and the draft includes 30% of the land and 30% of the sea to be protected by 2030. We've been working at National Geographic with the WIS campaign for nature and the government of Costa Rica to create a coalition of countries with high ambition that are supporting this. There are already over 30 countries supporting 30% 30, 30 of the planet protected by 2030. The European Union also has showing, is showing great leadership and making a, also a commitment to support this, this important goal. So this is a global deal for nature. This new deal that we need now is, uh, we hope, that is going to be agreed by 190 countries, the countries of the world, next year in China under the auspices of the United Nations. Thank you. Now, Carrie, it's hard to think of two uh, environments more different than the depths of the wild ocean and, and city streets and landscapes that you sometimes deal with. Uh, I wonder how much role there is for citizen scientists also in our oceans, as well as our urban and, and other land-based environments. There's an enormous role for citizen science, and it gets to exactly what Stephen mentioned. These are human issues, right? And so they require human solutions. And for biodiversity, part of that solution is building a constituency at multiple scales all over the world of people who care about and understand the biodiversity around them. And so iNaturalist provides a platform where people can share observations of biodiversity, be they from deep in the ocean for people who have access to, to those kinds of equipment, or what you find in the, the corner of your apartment in the middle of a city. By sharing those observations on iNaturalist, you yeah. connect with a community that has expertise and may be able to help you identify what you've seen. Tell us a little bit more about the City Nature Challenge that you're getting started. I, for one, am delighted to be able to hear the birds again here in New York City, one of the small upsides of this pandemic. And I'm just sure there are fascinating observations and opportunities everywhere. Tell us about that. Yeah, I want to give credit to um, folks I work with, Allison Young at the California Academy of Sciences and Leela Higgins at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, who started something called the City Nature Challenge in 2016. And it's grown over the last few years to include hundreds of cities around the world. And there are local organizers in each of those cities who are encouraging people starting at midnight on Friday to pay very close attention to the biodiversity wherever they are, be it in an apartment or um, you know, at, out at the edge of a city with access to a park. So over the course of four days, um, people are going to be sharing observations and the vast majority of those observations will be shared on iNaturalist. So you'll be able to see collectively what people around the world are finding during this, this really interesting time. Now, we often think of cities as harming nature or getting in the way of nature and biodiversity. Do you see opportunities there as well? We've got more and more people moving to cities, even if the, the cities are a little bit empty right now. That's a trend that's going to continue. What can we do to make that an opportunity rather than a problem for nature? Now, I think there has never been a better time for all of us to pay close attention to what is right inside our homes or outside our windows. And that opportunity exists every single day on iNaturalist, no matter where you are in the world. But the City Nature Challenge is an especially exciting opportunity to, um, to really do it, to have a sense of, of, of doing it at the same time as, as lots of other people. When it comes to urban biodiversity, you know, we may be we may be tempted to overlook the things that are common, the things that we see every day, the things that we might think are kind of boring because we're used to them. But I think we often find, and, and we have so many accounts of this from people on iNaturalist, when you actually start looking really closely, for example, when you try to start documenting all of the species that live in your small urban yard, I think you'll be surprised what you find when you start paying attention. When you start paying attention to what is growing in a patch of lawn that might actually have a dozen other species that 
people may refer to as weeds. Um, I think that 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 this is a great opportunity to pay special attention to those and and learn what they are. They almost surely have names, at least the plants. Um, and there's so much that we still have yet to discover about the biodiversity in cities. And I think science and we as individuals can benefit from paying close attention to it. Stephen, I'd like to bring you back in. What do you see as the role for citizen science in preserving the species that you've spent your career caring about? I'm, I'm sure there's a big contribution, but I'd love you to describe it for us. Well, I, I'll just re-emphasize that you, you, know, you cannot separate uh, humans from the environment. We are part of biodiversity, and often people think of themselves as somehow being separate. You know, we have um, a great a number of great uh, citizen science programs. One of them is called Virginia Working Landscapes. And it's really about working with um, landowners, large landowners who are interested in, uh, who are making money off of their land, um, perhaps by growing crops um, and, and showing them how they can do that with, with increasing biodiversity on their own land. So there, there are many people who are very interested in having uh, greener practices, doing things that are biodiversity friendly in what they're doing, and yet they don't have the tools and so when you give them the training and the tools, they eagerly will go in and with great pride, will uh, begin to monitor biodiversity, take ownership of that. And ultimately that's what we're trying to do is to get people to take ownership of the places that they live in to help to sustain them. You know, conservation is not something that we just do in foreign countries. We need to do it in our own backyards, whether it's urban uh, or rural uh, and whether it's, it's here or in Africa or anywhere else. So it's, to, I agree that the citizen science is a rich area for getting people on the side of seeing how biodiversity can, can create a win-win. We don't have to have it be a zero-sum game where biodiversity loses at the economic benefit of people. That's a wonderful note to finish on. I'm sorry we've only had these few minutes to discuss all of your important work, but we're going to say goodbye to Stephen, Enrique, and Carrie now. Thank you, all three of you. And I'm now going to introduce into the discussion uh, two people who are coming all the way to us from Costa Rica, a husband and wife duo at that, the tropical biodiversity ecologists Dan Jansen and Winnie Hulwick. Together, they have more than a century of experience in Costa Rica recording and conserving and restoring that wonderful country's forests and ecosystems. Dan and Winnie, thank you so much for joining us. Well, <laughs> thank you for having us. Um, here we are, and um, we've thought a lot about what we would say to you in a very short period of time. And uh, I think the opening sentence is that um, collectively, the two of us have spent about 110 years um, studying wild tropical biodiversity and living in it and living in the societies who actually own it. And so out of that, um, we have come some time ago to the conclusion that the only wild tropical biodiversity that's going to survive is that which the country that owns it decides it wants to, decide, to survive. Okay, That's the only bit. All the national parks, all our well-meaning thoughts, all our donations, all those things, they all contribute, but if the countries themselves don't want it, forget it. Because the long term is what matters, not next year or the next two years. The second thing about that is, 100%. we have come to the conclusion that the only way that can happen is if the countries themselves, the people in the countries themselves, as individuals, decide to do it. And what we're seeing happening here in Costa Rica is that the five million people in Costa Rica and their political bosses, their upper class, their middle class, their working class, all of them are primed for this kind of message to be allowed to figure out what is their own biodiversity and get it organized in such a way that they can actually do things with it. Now, tell me a little bit about bioliteracy. I'm fascinated by that concept. What do you mean about a population as well as a government becoming bioliterate? What it, it's gone silent. 
no, 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 that's fine. It's okay. Um, what we mean by that is that when you walk into a forest, when you walk out your back door, when you uh, eat something on a salad in your, on your tabletop in a restaurant, you know actually what it is, where it came from, what its name is, what it does in nature, how to find it when you want it, and what its natural history is. Those four basic things put on the web for all public consumption is what Costa Rica is in the process of doing right now. And this particular government has grabbed a hold of this as something that they want to make a sort of a brand for the country. Is that we, they, the we is the whole country, basically takes on the task over about a 10 year period of finding out everything that's in the country, getting a name on it, getting it on the web, beginning to know what its natural history is, beginning to know what it does, and beginning to see ways that it can actually be used by in different elements of society. I am not talking about scientists. I'm not talking about the commercial industry. I'm not talking about the Minister of the Environment. I'm talking about all of them together. And what we've found over the last year and a half of talking to sectors who are all over the Costa, Costa Rica is that they're ready to engage and put their sweat equity into it. The only thing it lacks is basically startup costs. Okay? So that's a serious chunk of money, but the simple point is the country itself is ready to do this, to turn itself into being bioliterate in the same sense that you are literate. You look up things in a dictionary, you write documents, you read things, you do all those things. Well, all those things are possible with wild biodiversity. And Costa Rica has in it as much biodiversity as all of North America in a country the size of West Virginia. And that large lump of resource is viewed really as a crop. It's just like corn or rice or cows or anything else. And managing the wild areas that have all that is like managing your farm. And so that instead of viewing it as something you cut down and convert into carbon or into energy or something like that, you manage it just like you would manage your own farm with corn and rice and cows and turnips and cabbages and all that other stuff. But here in the case is manage the wild area in the same way. So that's basically what we mean by bioliteracy. And the point is it would be just a, a dream in the sky, except that the Costa Rican government itself this private sector, the NGOs, the universities, all of them have resonated very well with the idea of them doing this to themselves, not inviting the outside world to come and do it for them, but rather to do it themselves. And they're certainly technically capable and they certainly have the biodiversity. I think I can say that with confidence that within 50 kilometers of our house in northern Costa Rica, there's as many species as all of Europe. So that's a big crop. And it's a big crop that's basically unknown at the present time. And by making it known, that gives people themselves, for all their different agendas, opportunities to make use of this, that, or the other piece, which then in the long run leads them to think it's a good idea to be part of the country. Mm -hmm. So that's what... Now, given the pandemic that we're all experiencing, do you consider that Costa Rica is at special risk now? given that uh, so much of the money that funds that work and enables that effective resource management comes from tourism, for example, depends on people being out of their natural environment rather than being quarantined at home. Uh, is there a special risk there? And, and, and what could people watching do to uh, support Costa Rica's recovery when we are all able to travel again? The reason why all those tourists spend three and a half billion dollars a year in Costa Rica before the virus is because of the national parks. You take away the national parks, the nice wild areas, as well as the things like national parks. How many people in Costa Rica? There are beaches everywhere. There are highways everywhere. There are taxi cabs everywhere. But Costa Rica has a special added green component that causes people to feel it's a good place to go for vacation, both educationally and for pleasure and for just learning things. And that's what is, that's the magnet, that's the crop. And as we often say, we're just a high yield kind of cattle. Winnie and I spend about $2 million a year in Costa Rica. We're simply like one cow that brings in a lot of income to the country. So after the coronavirus, of course, then we that have a real problem. A wonderful way. 
you're a very valuable cow, two very valuable cows. I would never want anyone to to think you weren't doing wonderful work there. We're basically out of time, but good luck in your future efforts where they're supporting you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Winnie. And thank you to everyone who's joined for this segment. We really appreciate your time and we hope you'll continue to support both our land and sea and our general biodiversity. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. You.